Some people like camping. Some people like camping so much they design and build their own camper. Seeing this home-built camper, I thought it could do with a flap over the rear because it looks similar to the hatchbacks I've tested. Throwing it into a simulation, and sure enough, the air has a significant low-pressure zone as it accelerates down into the wake, increasing lift. The numbers that came back were pretty bad. Initially, I was just going to attach a spoiler, reduce the drag by 10%, and be done with it. But that was only the beginning of reducing the drag by 30-35% to for this model. Both times I added a flap to the rear of a hatchback, it reduced drag by 10%. I expected something similar here. I placed the flap just before the low pressure patches ended. The reasoning was that the spoiler is far enough back to reduce the size of the wake and far enough forward to stop the low pressure patches from forming. This was remarkably effective, removing 13% of the drag, and the lift was reduced by a massive 65%. This was based on my first guess. Placement may not be exactly right, but the improvements were good enough to just move on. The problem now was the front and the side. There is a deep high pressure region in the front caused by the interaction between the storage box and the cabin. The first idea was to make the storage box round on top. That did nothing at best and really just made things a little worse. It shifted the centre of pressure forwards, but if the drag isn't reduced, I wasn't going to investigate why this occurred. Next, I thought the massive vortex structure caused by the interaction between the front surface and the side needed addressing. There's no way that that amount of air movement wasn't going to be costing some energy. There isn't any way to round off the corner, but if I could minimise the gradient, it could be essentially made by a virtual round off the body. The first attempt was minimal and made things worse. It shouldn't make things worse if done properly. And that worked much better, taking another 5-8% to off the drag, now 20% better than the baseline. I also added a step bridging the tail light and the wheel latch. This prevents the air being pulled under the floor, which would also impact the light. It halved the drag of the light, but it's only around 1% of the total. Looking at the flow structure, there is still a bit of rotation, and it begins at the apex of the front surface. Preventing the interaction between the roof and the center of the curve by creating a bracket was the next step. But then preventing the buildup of pressure on top of the storage box was an idea, along with the floor to smooth the air around the chassis. These three things combined work to give about 30 to 35% drag reduction. It also all but eliminated lift, now only 10% remains. We're talking a negligible amount of CLA of 0.08, or 43 newtons at 30 meters per second, which is a nice highway cruising speed of 108 kilometers per hour. So I was almost totally sure that this was the best outcome. That is, without optimising that which is on the trailer now. A problem was, I don't really know how much the corner blades were worth. Rerunning the model without them, it turns out the gap between the storage box and the floor is about 8% better than that not. The total to here is 23% less drag. Other than the rear spoiler, it's the biggest single improvement. It was also responsible for removing most of the lift, which is just better as the trailer will not lose grip as speed increases. The tail light now is 10% of what it used to be and can be considered negligible as 0.1% of the total. So the addition of the wing guides that takes the total up to 30-35% to of the drag reduction. I'll have to say that these are the trickiest and the most unstable results. Tricky because they'll take more than one attempt to get right, the issue is that they aren't a simple shape, even if the cross-section is simplified. It needs to follow the curvature of the edge. There are two brackets here. The addition of more will become a problem as the slope of the body flattens out and aligning them to the air will become important. Getting things right from this basic experiment may result in even more drag reduction beyond the quite nice 35%. Lastly, you can't discount the effect of the car on the trailer but more interesting, the trailer on the car. I was wondering if the car would affect the trailer. Initially, I was going to run a number of different cars, and some bigger ones specifically because they should reduce the drag of the trailer. But then I didn't, mainly down to physics, and how people driving large cars do it in spite of physics, so it doesn't really make sense they would be inclined to a more efficient camper. 
but then my car model is on the smaller size. A medium car size would have a larger wake, but this is an older car, and the newer ones would probably have a similar sized wake. On the more interesting subject of trailers impacting the car, this car is unusually draggy, or at least the model is with the wider wheels. The drag of this model without the trailer was a CDA of 0.76, with the trailer it was reduced to 0.5. The loss was with the baseline trailer. The more efficient the trailer became, the less efficient the car was. If I was to guess the effect on a newer car, a reduction of maybe 15-20% to 20 would, could be expected. In conclusion, only a tiny amount of work by adding the rear spoiler, floor and moving the storage box is worth a sizable drag benefit. The more complex corner modification would need a proper design process, but the reward seems high. Any other large modification to this camper trailer could come from around the wheels. Other than that, small changes to reduce the turbulence could accumulate maybe to about 2-5%. to 5%.